Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, I want to start by thanking the Historical Society for giving uh, me the invitation to come and talk about something um, that, that I'm very passionate about and that's very near and dear to my heart and that's the the history of, uh, uh, of the Lebanese of Yarmouth and of sustaining uh, our Lebanese identity and the current generation as well. Um, a lot of the um, narrative that I'm going to share tonight really is centered around that very first wave of immigration to, to North America. There's too many narratives to condense into a 45 minute to an hour presentation. So I'm going to do my best, sort of give a window for everyone to look through uh, where, where you might have a newfound appreciation for the immigrant narrative that comes with the Lebanese of Yarmouth. And certainly the majority of Lebanese that came to Yarmouth were Christian, but there certainly were Muslim immigrants at the same time. Um, one family in particular, the Ali family uh, in Cornwallis was very close to, to my family. But for the sake of tonight's presentation, it's gonna center around the political realities of the Christian population of Lebanon uh, in the later part of the, uh, of the 19th century. I also wanna thank my family uh, and when I say my family, I mean uh, the Emans, the Allens, the Basharas, the Shalalas, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Lidifs, um, the Saabs, the Shediaks. Um, I carry this story forward as being all of our story. And I specifically want to leave a message for my sons, Yusuf and Nassim Bashara. Someday, Yusuf and Nassim, you may watch this. And I want you to know that what Papa is presenting will always be your story to celebrate. You'll no doubt celebrate several identities in your life. And this one is your birthright, and I hope you always cherish it as a source of strength, comfort, and celebration. All right, now that the personal schmaltz is put aside, I also want to share the privilege of this moment by recognizing that we're in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we are all called to be treaty people. I also want to acknowledge that people of African descent have been a part of Nova Scotia for over 400 years. And I want to offer honor and gratitude to all ancestors and living persons of African descent who have given so much to this province for, for the benefit of the common good. So some vocabulary that's going to be helpful as we go through. The first wave of Lebanese immigrants to come to North America were predominantly Christian, as I said. And of those, uh, those Christian demographics, the majority were Maronite. And so when I use the word Maronite, I'm talking about one of the 23 rites that uh, make up the Catholic Church as a whole. So most people are very familiar with the Roman Catholic rite or the Latin rite, which is the largest branch of the Catholic Church and is the, and is the European centric branch. Um, but it's only one of 23. And so in the Middle East and specifically in Lebanon, the Maronite rite is the, is the, is the Catholic uh, rite or tradition in that area. Also Antiochian Orthodox, the Orthodox Christian tradition uh, that's prevalent in the Middle East. The formal title for that church is the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch and all the East, and its patriarch is in Damascus, Syria. And finally, the Druze. The Druze are an ethno-religious group with, their, with roots in, and I believe, Shia Islam, um, but adherents do not consider themselves a Muslim per se. They're, they're, like, they're, they're considered a breakaway sect. And they draw from many um, religious and philosophical traditions uh, that inform their religious practice. And so in the lower left-hand corner, we have the Maronite cross and Antiochian cross, and this star is the symbol for the Druze religion. And so the why? why, why the first wave? Well, beginning in 1840, there were some serious conflicts that had developed between Maronite Christians and the Druze in Lebanon. All of current day Lebanon and Syria was under the control of the Ottoman Empire and Lebanon was considered a territory of Syria. So at one point, and again, I'm, I'm learning this history as I do my research. Um, so I'm not a formal historian on these points, uh, but to give you the gist of, of, of the, uh, the context. Um, European powers intervened and partitioned Lebanon into Christian and Druze territories, and that made things worse. So the Maronites were finding economic success in Druze territories, because even in the southern part of modern day Lebanon, which was considered the Druze territories, a lot of this had to do with the, with the silk trade and the, and the production of silk in Lebanon. And, and um, uh, farming businesses preferred the farming techniques used by the Maronites over the Druze in the Druze territories. And so this caused uh, a considerable amount of tension. 
England supported the claims of Druze sovereignty in the south of Lebanon, and France sided with the Maronite Christians. So again, this all culminated to a point in uh, 1860 when there was um, the ruling Turkish authorities were sympathetic with the Druze, and they basically just stood by and watched as the Druze um, engaged in a 22-day uh, massacre against the Christian Maronite population. And during that time, there was 7,771 Maronite uh, people were killed. 560 Maronite churches were destroyed or overtaken. 360 villages were raided. 43 Maronite monasteries were raised and 28 schools were destroyed. So this was the moment of reckoning that really had the Christian population in what is now modern day Lebanon, making the decision to look for a better life elsewhere. And so for those who may not be able to um, identify Lebanon on a map, here's, here's a reference for you. On the, on the right, um, in this context, it's where Lebanon lies in, uh, in the Middle East. So bordered by Syria to the north and the um, east. So on the, on the left is the positioning of Lebanon in the Middle East, um, uh, or on the right rather. On the left, as you're viewing, this is a, a topographical image of Lebanon where you can see um, there's a mountain a range that basically runs from north to south through the, through the country. And specifically, I chose this, this image because where you see Kadisha Valley, Kadisha in, in, in Arabic means holy. And, and this, is, this is the bastion for the Maronite population in Lebanon. And the majority of families that would come to settle in Yarmouth are from that area uh, in Lebanon, just as a point of reference. And so the names of the villages, like a lot of the families when they came here, they identified strongly with the villages that they came from. So, uh, and, and, and again, all in this general region um, of the Wadi Kadisha, the, the holy uh, uh, valley of Lebanon. Um, so Bashare, Hadath al Jibbe, a lot of families from Yarmouth came from Hadath al Jibbe. Uh, Bazon, Barsa, Zahle, Tripoli, and Minyara. And this is, this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is where uh, most of the families uh, came from. And so the families that came, um, and again, this became a bit of a chain migration piece for some of these families, you know, um, immigration was a decade long event with parents coming first and then sending for their children once they were established, um, uh, extended family, so on. Um, but the families as, as they're known in Yarmouth, and I've tried to be uh, as exhaustive of every Lebanese family that's, that's been here, even if it was only for a, a brief period in Yarmouth, starting with uh, the last name Alam. That was anglicized to be Allen, so the Allen family from South End. Bashara Asa was the full name of what was later condensed to be Bashara. Boutros was the adopted name became Budro, so that it was more familiar specifically as an Akkadian name. Uh, Amin became Eman. Fayed, Jubaili, Kuraidum, Kuri, Nichols, the, the, and, and this should actually be reversed. The family name in Lebanon was Shudrewe, but the name adopted in Canada was Nichols because as a descriptor of Shudrewe, Nichols was some, somehow attached to that. There was a, a one marriage in the community by uh, Najibe Shediak, who is Elizabeth Shediak. Uh, she married a man whose name is Nahlus. They anglicized the Nahlus name to become Wallace. There's Jibreel, which is Gabriel. Noah, Saab, which was anglicized to Sap. Slayman, which was anglicized to Seaman. Shediak, Wakim. And then the families listed below are relative newcomers to our narrative as, as Lebanese Yarmouthians. The... Uh, Habib family, uh, uh, Zeki Habib, uh, with his son Fred and uh, Joey and Victor came here uh, in the early 90s and set up uh, their restaurant and have made a home here. Um, the Abidib family came in 1994 and opened up uh, the Little Lebanon restaurant that was housed at 100 Main Street. And the Akar family uh, has opened up a business in town in 2017. Their, their restaurant is on Forest Street. So now... The sociocultural context upon arrival, this is really framed around 1880 to, to the 1900. So while some Lebanese came to Yarmouth with financial, with some financial resources, the vast majority of families arrived with little to nothing. And for many, peddling was the first means of a viable income. 
And being a visible mayor, minority, speaking a foreign language, being Catholic or Orthodox Christian, the first immigrants did face many barriers to inclusion in what was a predominantly white Anglo Protestant environment. So as numbers increased through chain migration, so too did contempt and suspicion towards the Lebanese. I'm not talking in a Yarmouth context per se here, I'm talking in a North American context. Slurs such as dirty black Syrian, darky peddler, or, or the N word fronted with the word sand were not uncommon. And certainly within, within my lifetime, um, I've heard ample narratives through my family about some, some about moments when, when these things um, were experienced by, uh, by generations, more so by generations that came before. And from a Canadian context, in 1914, there was a Canadian federal politician, his name was Reverend James S. Woodsworth. To my understanding, he was, he was a part of a political movement that would eventually evolve into the NDP. But he, he made a public uh, statement that the Lebanese were the most undesirable class of all immigrants. So this is an excerpt from uh, the New York Times from 1890. And so this just sort of sets the tone for, for how the first wave of Lebanese migration um, was viewed by, by some. So sanctified Arab tramps, wretched Maronite beggars infesting this country. The foreign population in the lower part of the city of late years has been increased by the Arabic speaking element from the Lebanon and Syria. In clannishness and outlandish manners, these people resemble the Chinese and are what are called the Dago Italians. Nearly all of them are Maronites, and in many respects, they are inferior to the Chinese and Italians, who do possess a certain amount of self-respect and are willing to work honestly and hard for a living. Five years later, in the same paper, this article came uh, in 1890, 1885. A batch of Arabic beggars, six dirty Arabs from Mount Lebanon and Syria, arrived yesterday by the steamer of Chester. Dressed in red skull cap, short jackets, and baggy trousers that terminated at the knee, below which grimy legs extended down to a pair of low shoes. They had brought over a few rosaries and crosses, which they said they intended to sell and thus make a living. So again, this is this is um, evidence of what was uh, of of at least one element of the social climate that was working against um, um, the Lebanese when they arrived. And so very quickly. Um, there was the, the response of the Lebanese who had settled was to create um, associations for protection. And so the Lebanese community in Yarmouth was the first in the Atlantic provinces to create what was called the Syrian Protective Association. And the first meetings of this were held on 100 Main Street. And the association was formally inaugurated in 14, uh, July 14, 1912. The mandate of the association was to protect and advance the economic, social, cultural, and political well-being. The second of these associations popped up in St. John, New Brunswick, July 21st, 1914, two years later. And so these were the precursors to what would become Canadian Lebanon clubs once the state of, of uh, Lebanon uh, became distinct in 1938. And evidence of these clubs uh, are these ribbons. So on the left is the Syrian Protectorate Association, chapter number one, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, this ribbon is hanging on the wall of my dining room. Uh, and when I was a kid, I remember seeing it surface from time to time in the dining room of my grandparents, uh, Wilford and Mary Beshera, at 3 Trinity Place in Yarmouth South. Um, and I, I thought it was cool back then because the, the, the tassel at the end is actually uh, uh, spun brass. Later, as I, as I deepened my, my desire to want to wanna know more about, uh, about my Lebanese identity and, and culture, I, I, I came across the fact that St. John had the second of these. And I'm, and I'm trying to figure out if there were more in existence. But the only two that I'm certain of that were in existence under this name were our chapter in Yarmouth and the one that was in St. John, New Brunswick. With the fall of the Ottoman Empire, under the direction of the League of Nations, France was given the mandate to oversee the stabilizing of Syria, including Lebanon. And so beginning in 1923, Lebanon fell under this mandate. And in 1938, the decision was made to recognize it as its own distinct state. When this happened, in the, in the materials that I've inherited through my family, it is so very clear that this was met with much rejoicing by the Lebanese throughout North America. Um, and it gave birth to the very first um, cedar clubs, um, uh, Lebanese society clubs, 
And so with the change for those who had immigrated, all reference to Syrian identity was, was left, left behind. And Yarmouth Syrian Protective Association, it, there's evidence that it continued to exist under varying names. But on October 23rd, 1938, the Canadian Lebanon Club of Yarmouth was founded in the home of Joe Beshera, which would be my great grandfather at 100 Main Street. And meetings alternated between his home and the home of Philip Eamon. And the reason that I know that is because we have newscape paper clippings uh, from, I believe it would be the Yarmouth Light that attest to it and that, that, uh, that tell the story. So shortly after um, the organizing of the club, um, the membership was able to get a building on Horton Street. Another newspaper clipping speaks to the club having a permanent home. So Yarmouth has a new clubhouse, the only one other in the community whose ownership is within the organization's membership. The other is the Kiwanis Club. So the, it goes on to speak to, um, uh, you know, the, the inaugural meeting, the, the first celebration of having the community in the club in 1938. And so this is the constitution, the front page of the constitution and bylaws of the Canadian Lebanon Club of Yarmouth. In, in my research, again, with the documents that I've inherited, it's clear that there was exemplars of club constitutions that were being shared between communities. So St. John um, would send what they were working on to Yarmouth, Halifax, the same, Sydney, all of these places had Lebanon clubs. Um, and I have copies of each of them. So you can see how they were trying to create some consistency between communities in terms of what the mandate of the club would be, clubs would be. And the two things that really stu stood out for me on, on this particular page are Clause B and Clause D, the educational and the national pieces of this document. You know, you think in terms of immigration to a new country, that assimilation is something that is, you know, to varying degrees, it's inevitable. But the more I read these documents, the more I see in them that that first and second generation wanted their children to maintain a Lebanese identity and continue the cultural and, 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 and um, heritage pieces of, of being Lebanese in this new land of Canada for them. And so those little clauses that, that say, you know, provide the opportunity for all members and the young children of the members to learn and speak the Arabic language and to understand and appreciate Arabic literature. And under national, the fourth objective of the club shall be teaching of the members and particularly the children of the members to understand the customs, traditions, and culture of the Republic of Lebanon and to appreciate their racial heritage. This document um, was one that was shared between clubs that, again, just it speaks to the establishment, uh, the separation of Syria from Lebanon. And it went to Mr. Daniel Saab uh, in Halifax, who I'm assuming was the club president of the, the, the Halifax Lebanese Society. And so it just, it just reads that the, the honor and it's from the High Commissioner of the Republic of France of Syria and Lebanon. In reply to your letter uh, addressed to the postal authorities, I have the honor of informing you that Syria, capital Damascus, and Lebanon, capital Beirut, are two separate and distinct republics. The people of the first of these states are the Syrians and the second are the Lebanons. It is wrong, likewise, for one to employ the term Syrian to designate together the territories placed under the authority of the French mandate. So a lot of this came out with the fall of the, of the Ottoman Empire. My understanding is that Turkey was... The, Turkey, the, 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 the boundaries for modern day Turkey were decided um, through the Treaty of Lausanne in Switzerland. And so for a lot of Lebanese who were, who had left um, in that first wave, they came to Canada with Turkish passports listed as Syrians for the most part, but they never identified as Syrian. They always identify well, primarily as Maronite, um, but, as, but as Lebanese. So a lot of Lebanese um, uh, were given the opportunity through the uh, 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 Consulate General of France to apply to, re to, to, to claim their Lebanese nationality. And so this document um, was my great grandfather, Joseph George Allen's, uh, where, where he, is, he is fully claiming his identity as being a citizen of Lebanon. And this was very common um, in Lebanese communities throughout the province at that time. Uh, interestingly enough, the Treaty of Lausanne um, was a 100-year treaty that actually expires next year in 2023. There's, there's some dialogue that could be said about that. 
This is a, an invitation to the fifth meeting of the Lebanon Club in Yarmouth. Um, what I thought was cool about this was that the invitation had with it a little flag of the French tricolor with the cedar of Lebanon in the middle. And so this was the, the first um, uh, European sanctioned state flag of, of, of Lebanon prior to the current flag. And these are just exemplars of, of correspondence between Lebanese communities elsewhere and with Yarmouth. Um, and in 1939, it is very clear from the ephemera that I have around this, that um, the communities were all vying to go to the United States for, in the middle, you'll see the third annual convention of the Lebanese Society of America. Um, and so a lot of the correspondence between clubs was, who are we going to send as our representatives? How are we going to get there? Will we take the boat from Yarmouth to Boston? So on and so forth. But it also shows the networking that was very, very strong and, and, and very apparent between Lebanese communities at that time uh, in, in the Atlantic provinces. And so here we have a picture of the Canadian Lebanon Club of Yarmouth membership uh, in 1942. Many of my family, Eamons, uh, Shediaks, Allens, Shalal, uh, Nichols, yeah, most families that settled here, Woodrow's, they're represented in this photo in one way or another. One side note that uh, was very interesting to me, um, I'm putting the cursor uh, on my great-grandmother, Ethel Beshera, and you'll notice that around her neck is a locket. After she died in 1981 or 82, her effects were, were shared with, with other members of the family. And my dad actually came into possession of that locket. And when you open it on one side is a picture of her son, David, who was known as Muzzy Bashara, And on the other side was a son, Doug. This is 1942. So the Second World War is in mid stride at this point. And I, it was a powerful connective piece for me to realize Doug and David aren't in this picture. They've already been sent overseas. And so this locket that I was introduced to in the 1980s is present in this photo from the 19, from 1942. So it's just, it's just, it was one of those little research pieces that like tugged at the heartstrings when I recognized it. Uh, another little piece, uh, 1951, the club had a lobster dinner and admission was $1. I uh, encouraged the historical society to follow suit. I will buy the first hundred tickets uh, if they're at the same price uh, and distribute them uh, gladly through my family. Um, but can you imagine a lobster dinner for a buck? This is the burning of the mortgage of the Canadian Lebanon Club uh, at the hall. On the left is uh, the, the parish priest, Father Penny. In the middle is Johnny Allen, who was the club president at that time. Uh, and the gentleman on the right, I'm, uh, I wanna say his last name is Grantley. I don't, I don't even know why, um, but he was a bank manager. Uh, so if anybody watching has any insight on what the name of this gentleman is, I would love to, I'd love to know it. And these are just a couple of photos uh, of, there's multiple families that aren't all related here. So this un undoubtedly was a, a club um, picnic uh, somewhere in Yarmouth County, just to show a gathering outside of the club hall. Uh, and a second photo of the same. And so now uh, we're going to start to go through um, some snippets of, of, of families, original families and their businesses. So this house at 100 Main Street, which in modern times, most people would recognize as being uh, the home of the Little Lebanon restaurant. In my family, first came into possession of it through the Shetty Acts in, in, um, in, in eight, the 1895, 1900, something in the, that time period. And to take you back to what this looked like and to, and to reinforce why this building, for, to me anyway, is of such cultural significance is because it was Lebanese owned in the town of Yarmouth for almost a hundred years. But this is what it looked like when Joseph Louis Shediak had the building in uh, around 1900. And so Joseph Louis Shediak came from uh, Minyara, which is just outside of, of Tripoli in Lebanon, about 20 kilometers as the crow flies. He came, we know that this branch of the Shediak family was, was educated. Uh, they were literate in the Arabic language. Um, they left lots of, lots of books behind um, that, that would give insight to the fact that they were, they had the ability to, 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 to read. He would have started off with, with some means, I think, 
But even if you take a look at the front of the store, it's a bit of a yard sale. It's, it's the remnants of, of, of bartering maybe, or doing like a second hand shop to augment the revenue of the business. So there was a grocery attached to it to be sure. But if you take a magnifying glass and get up close to the table in the front, there's sabers, there's muskets, there's, there's wind up clocks, oil lamps. There's a, a, a vacuum cleaner on, on like a, on sleigh, uh, some second empire furniture, um, so it's one of my favorite photos and it's, it's arguably one of the first Lebanese businesses to exist in Yarmouth. This is Joseph Louis's um, wife and, and three of uh, four children. His wife was Mary Berchast. In her obituary, she was uh, um, 101 years old and, and touted as being in that year, the oldest resident in Yarmouth. His children, at the, starting from the top is Najibe. Najibe Shadiak, her ang English name um, was Elizabeth. Uh, she married a Lebanese man with the last name Nahlous, which we know very little about, um, but we do know that the Nahlous name was anglicized to Wallace. Uh, the, the man in the middle is um, uh, Louis uh, Joseph Shadiak. Uh, Louis married a woman named Mamie Thibault. They had two children, Harry and Ernie Shadiak. One of the interesting points about Louis is that he was actually hired as an interpreter for survivors of the Titanic. So little known fact, there was 174 um, Lebanese passengers on the Titanic. Uh, of the 174, 43 survived. And the vast majority of them were in third class uh, and, and went down with the ship. Um, and then at the bottom is Naza Shediak, whose English name would be Ethel. Ethel Beshera. She would uh, be the link between the Shediak family and the Beshera family that would turn 100 Main Street from a Shediak business um, to, uh, to the Beshera family. And so this is a copy of their marriage uh, certificate between Joseph Beshera and Ethel Shediak, which in turn brought in a new era for 100 Main to become uh, owners owned by the Beshera family. So on the left, there's a picture of my great grandfather, uh, Joseph George Beshera with his son, Victor. Uh, on the right is a family photo that I assume Victor took because he's the only one that's not in it. But from left to right in the back, uh, my grandfather, Wilfred Beshera, his sister, Louise Beshera, uh, Joseph George Beshera and his wife, Ethel. Uh, on the right is Stanley Beshera. And in the front is Doug Beshera, uh, who was in the Royal Canadian Engineers. And this was probably close to just before he left to go overseas. In the middle is Mac Beshera holding a dog. And Uncle Mac had uh, the garage on Adelaide Street uh, in Yarmouth. His son Tommy now has it. His son Jason has a very successful business. And on the right is David Beshera, known as Muzzy Beshera. And David served with the um, Royal Canadian Army Service Corps overseas. My grandfather, Joe Beshera, um, served in the 112th Battalion um, in Halifax during the First World War, and, and, and in doing so, secured his Canadian citizenship. Part of, and he was a part of uh, an escort, uh, troop escort, to go to England. But there's question as to whether or not he actually made it overseas. But we do know that uh, the 112th Battalion was a special service battalion in the Canadian um, uh, Expeditionary Forces. And they were tasked with the recovery of uh, wounded and dead from the Halifax explosion. Uh, this is a, an Arabic Bible that was brought over probably by the Shediak family um, and was inherited by the Beshera family. It's in our possession and the first four or five pages of this uh, chronicle every birth, every death and every, every uh, wedding uh, that the family, the Shediak and Beshera family ha had in Canada. That's in pretty hard shape, but it's, uh, it's a treasured item uh, in the family. And so again, we return to uh, what, the, what the building looks like current day. And so here's some uh, of the other families. Uh, this is the Coritum family, Ferris and Mary Coritum and their three children, uh, Evangeline, Lyman and Wilford. Wilford owned a coal company and also at one point uh, would have exported salt cod as evidenced by the little salt cod box that we have. This is the Allen family. This would be my, my paternal grandmothers, my Sitthi's family. From left to right is Joseph George Allen, his son Rufus, his daughter Minnie. In the middle is, is our precious uh, 
Aunt Cecilia. Uh, Aunt Cecilia, um, this picture was taken in 1926. And I believe Aunt Cecilia was born in 1922. We're, we're still grieving her loss. She passed away at the age of 99 on New Year's Eve just this past year. And she was the last surviving member of, of, of that generation. Next to Aunt Cecilia is Aunt Martha who um, married uh, a Lebanese uh, man in, in Boston and lived her life there. Uh, next to Martha is uh, Sam, uh, Sam Allen. And then my great-grandmother, Amelia Sapp Allen. In the middle are George Allen and my grandmother, Mary uh, Allen Bashara. And on the floor are Mike Allen and Johnny Allen. And about well, 1931, the last member of the family arrived on the scene, and that was Teresa Allen. She was a bit of a surprise. This is just a quick story about the naturalization of my grandfather, my great grandfather, uh, George Allen. He was first naturalized uh, at the public courthouse in New Glasgow uh, in 1911. And then with the Naturalization Act of 1914, for some reason, that was seemingly made null and void, and he had to go through the process of naturalization all over again. So his final um, um, formal citizenship as a Canadian citizen and a British subject was in August of 1934. That's a long stretch of time to go without protection of the state and, and services and amenities of the state. This was a gift of the IODE, which is a well-known organization in Yarmouth um, that's congratulating him on becoming a British subject and a Canadian citizen. It reads that he's now admitted to share with us all the ancient liberties of the British peoples. And this is Alan's store. This is on 104, I believe, Main Street. This is the only picture of the store that I have in this, in this era. And from left to right, is my uncle uh, Stan Bashara. Next to him is my great uncle Johnny Allen, George Allen, Victor Bashara, and Dominic Nichols. This is John and Mary Sapp Nichols. They came to, to Lebanon, uh, to, to, to Yarmouth. I think John at one point was in South America before he made it to Yarmouth. But they had a store on Main Street uh, where, to recent memory, it would be the site where the Yum Yum Tree was, where uh, the Stroog family, mm -hmm. um, Esther Stroog and her family would have had their store. And you can see on the right uh, is the original Louis Shapiro store. This is Philip and Marjorie Eamon with their children, Margaret and Julia. Philip and Marjorie, I remember Marjorie when I was, when I was young. Philip had died before I was born, I'm quite sure. But they owned a store located between Commercial and Pearl Street, and it was a pool room. They had gas pumps. I could remember going up. Marjorie's Arabic name was Mahbube, and I always knew her as that. And, and I used to serve mass um, at Notre Dame of Fatima Parish in, in, in South End, and she was faithfully there every Sunday or Saturday night, sitting in the front row. And I remember she would have... Um, like almost like a leopard skin pill pillbox hat, and she would she would come up to me before she would leave and hug me, squeeze my cheeks, and tell me what a good priest I was going to be. This is Sir Samuel and Emily Fayed Nichols. We say Sir Samuel because Samuel was given a, a papal knighthood for his his devotion and work within the Catholic Church. Uh, Sam's brother, older brother, Peter Nichols, started this business, corner of Haskell and Main Street. And so people would remember this in recent memory as being, I uh, believe it belonged to Donnie Usher. And, and less than two years ago, uh, the entire structure um, was engulfed by fire and burned to the ground. And this is Julia Sapp Eamon with her children, Frederick and Frida. Fred would, would uh, be the, the founding father of Eamon's Meat Market and also become the mayor of Yarmouth. Frida was uh, a hairdresser for most of her life, but in, when I was a teenager, I, I was blessed to be able to spend a fair amount of time with her and some of my great aunts who taught me most of the Arabic that I know. And I remember vividly being in awe. I remember playing an Arabic card game called Bosra at my aunt Teresa's. Frida was present. Uh, my grandmother was there as well. And they started speaking Arabic amongst themselves. And I was, I, I didn't know that they had a level of fluency that they had. And that was such a gift for me. It's such, such a, a window into what life was like for them as kids being fluent in Arabic. And so, of course, Eamon's Meat Market on, on uh, Main Street in Yarmouth South 
the longest Lebanese owned um, business um, in, in the town of Yarmouth and, and has spanned three generations. This building, this the legacy of this store is very dear to in the hearts and minds of the Lebanese in Yarmouth and, and, and many people in Yarmouth. Being a hockey town, I also want to give a nod to Thomas Victor Shediak. Thomas Shediak um, was the manager of Yarmouth's very first indoor rink. So our first rink manager in the town of Yarmouth was, was Lebanese. And he and his sister Hattie were instrumental in the establishment of the playground at South End. Um, out of their own resources, they funded, um, I don't know if, if people might remember, there was a wading pool that was there for years. Um, well, it was Thomas and Hattie that financed that for the kids of South End and, and, and started the evolution of what would become the, the South End playground. And so now we've got uh, Yarmouth Lebanese in politics. Fred Eamon Sr. was mayor of Yarmouth. My grandfather, Wilfred Beshera, was a town councillor. Thomas Shediak that I just introduced. His son, Tom, who was a public educator uh, during his working career, uh, uh, was a town councillor. Byron Boudreau of Lebanese descent was a town councillor. Our current mayor, Pam Eamon Mood, is our, is our mayor. And uh, our current MLA is the Honorable Zach Churchill. And Zach. So one of the things that I wanted to share, faith was a huge part of, of Lebanese, of the Lebanese culture then and now. Uh, but that first generation left, left their fingerprints all over St. Ambrose Cathedral. And you wouldn't know it unless you were introduced to it. So for the sake of their memory, I just want to walk through some of the things in the church that they left as, 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 as I would like to think an enduring presence uh, and a reminder for those of us uh, in whatever way makes sense to us to keep the faith. So when you enter the church, the bells and the chimes of the church uh, were donated in memory of John Albert Shediak by his wife. The plaque itself has Arabic written on it, um, which has uh, John Albert uh, Shediak's name and that he's from the village of Harath al -Jibbe. Going into the, um, the choir loft, the window of St. Cecilia, who's the patron saint of musicians, uh, was donated by the Karaitam family in memory of Fer Ferris and Mary Karaitam by, by their son Wilfred. On the western wall of the church, uh, the stained glass window of uh, St. John the Baptist was donated by the Noah family in memory of Dominic Noah. On the eastern wall of the church, close to the sanctuary, is the stained glass window of St. Peter, uh, first pope of the Catholic Church, donated in memory of Peter Nichols by his brother Sam. And at the very bottom, there's this little pane that you'd miss if you weren't looking for it. But again, it's an Arabic inscription that says Boutros Nichols, native of Harath al -Jibbe. The main altar in St. Ambrose Church was the gift of Sophie Shediak in memory of her husband, John Albert, the same family that donated the bells in the, in the bell tower. And the cathedra, which is the, the proper name for the, the seat of the bishop, which is why the building is called a cathedral, was donated in memory of Mrs. Uh, Salem Shediak, who her name was Mary Shediak, and she would be, this would be the parents of Thomas Shediak, the first rink manager, and the grandparents of Tommy Shediak currently living uh, in Yarmouth with uh, his wife, Julie, and daughter, Catherine. Finally, in Our Lady of uh, Calvary Cemetery, there's two Cedar of Lebanons that were planted there in 1943. They were brought over as seedlings uh, from Lebanon and donated uh, in memory of uh, John Albert Shediak by his wife, uh, Sophie Jabaili. And so modern day, what's it like to be of Lebanese descent in Yarmouth? Well, it's a matter, it's part reclamation and a whole lot of preservation. Uh, we still cook Lebanese food. We still use Arabic and common parlance, although it's fragments of, of, of sentences and individual words, mostly for food. And so my job is, as, as a papa is, is to make the option available for both of my sons and my nieces and nephews and anybody in the Lebanese community to know where they come from heritage-wise and to take a level of pride in it without having any sense of superiority. This photo was taken, I took my sons to the, it's the uh, Monument for Lebanese Immigration in Halifax. Very happy moment for me as a father. One of the things that we do every year, um, at least in, in the Beshera family, is we go to the grave of uh, Joseph George Beshera, the first Beshera to come to Yarmouth in 1903 on Remembrance Day. 
Uh, we offer prayers. We, we give thanks for his service in the military. Um, this photo was taken well over 20 years ago. My grandfather, Wilfert, uh, is in the middle. Uh, we also visit his grave now in Our Lady of Calvary Cemetery. So these are some of the Canadian traditions that we've adopted that help us stay present of mind and where we come from. Uh, in 2018, the province of Nova Scotia designated uh, November as Lebanese Heritage Month. Two years ago, we started a committee to, to recreate a, a, a more inclusive Lebanon society that would be a place of belonging for anybody of Middle Eastern descent, not just Lebanese. COVID put the kibosh on that almost immediately, but we were able last November to have a gathering at Town Hall Representatives from the, um, the uh, Canadian uh, Lebanon Society of Halifax uh, came down. We did a little information session on Lieutenant Edward Arab, who was last year's recipient for Heritage Day. Uh, we opened the, uh, the event with the playing of the Lebanese National Anthem in O Canada. And we made sure that the youngest generation of Lebanese descent were the kids that raised the flag. So here in, we took over the inside of Town Hall, had some speeches, uh, shared some Lebanese sweets and coffee. Um, the Halifax contingent, uh, Marianne Laba and her husband, Joe Laba, came down and gave greetings. Um, Georgette Fadoul, her husband, Fadoul Fadoul. Uh, Georgette's the president of the Canadian Lebanon Society of Halifax. They came down um, to support us, as well as a member, uh, uh, Faraz Zaitoun and his wife. Their presence meant more to us on that day than, than words can express. Having, having another Lebanese community come down to recognize us, to celebrate with us, and to support us was, was beautiful. That night, we went to Rudders, had a nice meal together. The next day, uh, we went to, to Mass at St. Ambrose, and then everybody parted to, to head back to the city. A bit of a crash course in Yarmouth Lebanese 101. This becomes, as a video um, archive, something that future generations um, can take a look at long after uh, uh, we've all moved on. Uh, so I'm thankful that I was able to do this and, and, and that the historical societies had the vision for, for, for videoing it and keeping it as an archival piece. So thank you.